So shock, a little bit of a concept. Did everyone take a chance just to glance at the chapter? Okay, cool. It'll make things a little easier. So shock, remember when we're talking about shock, everything comes back to perfusion. In fact, you can generalize that statement that everything we do in this field comes back to perfusion. Okay, everything we're doing is trying to get blood supply. So when we're talking shock and we're talking inadequate cellular perfusion, right? Hypoperfusion, there's some things we got to be aware of. Okay, so any compromise in perfusion can lead to cellular injury or death. Okay, and then in the early stages, the body attempts to maintain homeostasis. What does homeostasis mean? Do you guys remember? <clears throat> that balance, right? Equilibrium. We're always searching for it. So remember when we were, well, we talked about, but it was in your benchmark, you guys found out, compensatory shock, right? That's going to be that homeostatic search, right? When our blood pressure goes down and our pulse rate goes up to accumulate or compensate for that, that's going to be main, trying to maintain that homeostasis. But the body in attempting to maintain homeostasis usually does itself a little bit more damage a lot quicker, okay? So some quick pathos, so diffusion, right? Remember the passive process in which molecules move from an area of high concentration to areas of low concentration, right? So think about it this way. Well, let me, let me ask you guys a question. What in our body actively uses diffusion to get into our blood? Oxygen, oxygen right? We have that CO2 oxygen exchange. Do you guys remember my, my analogy for diffusion? <clears throat> about like you're at the place? Oh, yeah. yeah, we're at the concert, right? Shoulder, shoulder. Perfect. Does anybody need any further explanation on what diffusion is then as a process? Okay. So our oxygen and carbon dioxide moving across the walls of the alveoli. Okay, they're, they're gonna move through that. Um, pretty important for our perfusion, right? Because the three things our body needs to perfuse are what? What are the three things our body needs to perfuse? One of them's oxygen. What's the other one? Not CO2, maybe we haven't talked about it. So sugar, so oxygen, sugar, right? Fuel, and then waste removal. All three of those processes have to happen for diffusion, or excuse me, for perfusion to happen appropriately, okay? So diffusion plays a big role in perfusion because we need the oxygen to keep our cells alive, okay? So big three though, when it comes to perfusion, oxygen, fuel, waste removal. All three of those have to be accounted for, okay? Now in cases of poor perfusion, transportation of carbon dioxide out of tissues can be impaired, right? If we have damaged tissues, there's less CO2 leaving those cells, I can start throwing this off. Do you guys remember what stimulates our breaths in general as people? Talked about it during, huh? What was it? Increase in carbon dioxide, right? Because carbon dioxide being our waste product, instead of our body saying, we need more oxygen, its focus is a little flip. It says, we need to get rid of the waste to make room for more oxygen, right? So it's gonna be a big portion. If we have damaged cells that have less CO2 to circulate into our body, we're gonna start throwing off a lot of different systems at the same time, okay? And if we have that buildup of CO2, results in dangerous buildup of waste products, which can cause cellular damage, right? They're waste products for a reason. They're designed to be get, got rid of. Getting rid of, got, you know what I mean, right? Um, now, when we go to shock, right, hypoperfusion, underperfusing, shock is a state of collapse and failure of the cardiovascular system that leads to inadequate circulation. Now, I don't really much like that statement, and the reason being is that it isolates cardiovascular system. Shock can be uh, global. When I say the term global, I mean throughout the entire body, right? It doesn't have to be specific to a system. Typically, we have, a, we have several different types, okay? There is shock that pertains to the cardiac system. There's shock that pertains back to uh, the neuro system. There's shock that has to do with just infections, okay? But on the same time, right? I don't like the statement because it feels like it's just isolating shock as one thing, but at the same time, think about this. What's the one thing that pumps blood through your body, right? Your heart, so if that fails, right? Every, if, or excuse me, if that's put under strain, it's gonna be one of the first things to fail, right? If everything else around it, his buddies are failing, he's not long for this world either. Okay, um, so early recognition with shock can save lives and then requires immediate recognition and rapid transport. Here's the deal with shock. Realistic, real life answer, shock is very difficult to identify. It is, it doesn't matter who you are, okay? Because different people, right? Different skin tones reflect differently. Um, 
uh, different people's physiology can be a little bit different. Okay, so the, the thing with shock is it's very, very hard to identify, which means your, your answer should be, or your go-to in your mind answer should be, let's start treatment early, right? The sooner we get treatment started, the better off they're gonna be. Now, before we even get too far, rapid treatment, there's three things that you need to do to treat for shock, and they're really easy. Put them on oxygen, lie them supine, and cover them with a blanket. Three really easy things. Now, those three really easy things trip a lot of people up when it comes to assessments and scenarios and things of that nature, because they just say, I'm going to treat for shock. Well, how? And then when you ask how, they go, I'm going to treat for shock. Right? It doesn't answer my question. Remember the three little things. Um, there was, there's a guy at Ada County currently, but when I was in medic school, he would come in and proctor a lot of our exams or a lot of our assessment stuff. And he failed an entire class's national registry because they didn't treat for shock. Now, it could have been an overreaction from him, probably knowing him, but also, right, same time, we got to treat for shock. So if you're not mentioning it, it's a critical aspect of this job, okay? So cardiovascular system consists of three parts, pump, set of pipes, and our content, okay? I like to think of them as pumps, pipes, fluids, okay? They have one pump, our heart, we have our pipes, or our vasculature, right, arteries, veins, and then we have our fluid, our blood. All three of those things have to be present for us to be perfusing well, okay? So when we're talking about like a perfusion triangle, the three things that need to be met, these are the three things. They make up each point of our perfusion triangle. Pump, pipes, fluids, right? All three need to be there. They're all even, equal. Now, for someone to be in shock, they only need to have a problem with one of the three. Okay, now when we're talking shock, typically it's going to be a trauma related thing. That said, medical conditions can throw you into shock. Okay, um, does anyone know? It's a type of shock, but does anyone know what it's called when you get a really bad infection in your body and become systemic? Sepsis, sepsis, right? Septic shock, right? That is a shock state, but it has nothing to do with trauma. So sepsis is one of those that can be pretty infectious, infection driven or is infection driven. Okay, so it doesn't always have to be trauma, but the majority are. So looking at this, uh, there's a lot of different terms for this little diagram. The one that I like is the one that was used by the teacher before me. It's called Mr. Snowman because it reminds him of a snowman. I don't see it. That's why I love it. Um, but, so this is how we generally talk about our circulation. This is how we generally talk about our perfusion. Okay, so we'll start from the right. What are these big vessels, the big blue vessels? Without reading the names, you cheaters. The vena cava, right? Where does the right or the vena cava go to? Right atrium. Right atrium to where? Right ventricle. Right ventricle goes through what to get to the lungs? Pulmonary arteries. Is that blood oxygenated? Okay, so once it's in the lungs, it's making its way back to the heart. What does it go through to get to the heart again? Pulmonary veins. Is that one oxygenated? Perfect. So from the, the lungs to the left side, what, where does it go first? Atria, from the atria where? Ventricle, ventricle through what? Aorta, and then out to the body, okay? Now, as long as you guys can remember that cycle, you're gonna be fine. There's, there's a reason I'm burning it into your head. I know it feels redundant, but this is the thing that trips people up, and if you can get it now, it makes it easier, okay? So the nice thing is if we look at this diagram, right, the lungs and then these kind of extracellular bundles up here look pretty similar. And the reason they look similar is because they're performing similar jobs, okay? Both of them are, are dealing with blood gases, right? The lungs obviously bring oxygen in, bring CO2 out. As our body circulates that blood, remember when we talked back to anatomy all the way back to like the third day of class, right? from artery to arteriole to capillary, from capillary to venule to vein, right? Do you guys remember that split? Okay, that's where this is happening, okay? So this artery, there are aorta branches an artery off, that artery will break down into arterioles to this capillary. And then from here is where we're gonna have that dropping off of oxygen, picking up of CO2, recirculating, okay? And that same process happens in the lungs as well, okay? Um, now, some, I, I was doing some reading and I actually found an interesting point about capillary beds and arterioles and how small they are. They're so small that a red, a red blood cell barely fits through there. 
Okay, these are, this is very microscopic level type things we're talking, okay? So when we look at a human body, you're not gonna see all their capillary networks because they're so small. Okay, keep that in mind. Is there any questions about the circulation in the body? Anybody kind of tripped up with it? Okay, if you are tripped up, we have a YouTube video as well. I spent a lot of time drawing a lot of pictures like this, okay? So if you wanna take a look at it, feel free um, if you're stuck. Okay, so the perfusion triangle, like I was saying, this is gonna be the three portions that we need to have hit for our body to perfuse, right? Our pump has to be functioning well, our blood, our fluid has to be moving. We have to have a, a solid amount of that fluid. And then our blood vessels need to be able to transport that, right? Now, um, with our fluid content, what do you think happens to blood pressures if you're losing fluids? They go down, right? What happens, do you think, if our vascular vasoconstricts really aggressively, what happens to our blood pressure? It goes up, right? So remember, it's not just about the vasculature dilating and constricting, right? Or that backwards, constricting and dilating, right? It's also about how much fluid do we even have in the first place? Because some people can't afford to lose a lot of fluid. Uh, for example, my sister, she's like five foot six, buck 15, maybe. Um, she's someone who resting her blood pressure is like 105. That's normal for her, right? She just doesn't have a lot of blood volume. She's just not one of those people. So it's dependent on the person, okay? So that's another reason shock, once again, is tough to identify because different people have different blood volumes, different people have different blood pressures, right? So we're gonna have a hard time identifying that stuff from time to time. So make it easy on yourself and just start treating early, right? If something in your gut says, this feels bad, maybe we just get going, treat for shock, right? You guys will find that treating for shock is almost pushing the line of your scope. Right? That's basically where you guys live, because medications aside, right, when we get to that point. But when it comes to trauma, oxygen, putting a blanket on, driving fast are the three things an EMT basics going to do. Okay? Those are the three big things you are going to do. So blood pressure, right? the pressure of blood within the vessels at any moment in time. Now, when we're talking vessels, we're talking arteries. Remember with our blood pressures, right? if we take a blood pressure, as we're occluding that arm, we're blocking that artery. right? And we know that for sure because we can take a blood pressure over palp, right? We can feel that pulse return. So it's about the arterial pressure. The venous pressure is kind of like a back pressure, okay? That's, you need a back pressure for forward pressure to really apply, okay? So our systolic peak arterial pressure, that is the most pressure our heart is putting out on our vasculature per contraction, okay? otherwise known as the action of systole, right? If the heart's contracting, that's systole. So and then the, on the flip side of that coin, the diastolic pressure. So as the heart is relaxing, right? Pressure in the arteries while the heart rests between heartbeats or the action of diastole, right? Systole is contraction, diastole is relaxation. Okay, same thing with our blood pressure. Contraction's gonna be our top number, relaxation's our bottom number. And then typical rule of thumb, the lower your diastolic number, the better your heart health is. Okay, now you're gonna hear the idea of pulse pressures here as well, okay? So I'll talk about it and then I'll tell you the way I also think about it. So pulse pressures is the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressure, right? So do so you guys know what type of math we're doing if we're talking about the difference? No? Subtraction, okay, yeah, it got really quiet for third grade math. I got a little alarmed. Yeah, subtraction, right? So you're gonna take your systolic number, you're gonna subtract your diastolic number, and that gives you your pulse pressure. Okay, now it signifies the amount of force the heart generates with each contraction, and a pulse pressure less than 25 may be seen in patients with shock, okay? Now, let's think about it this way. Do you think if somebody is hypertensive, if they're 180 over 100, Right? What do you think that pulse pressure is, right? It's 80 if we do the quick maths, right? If someone's hypotensive, they have a blood pressure of 90 over 60 or 80 over 60, right? That's 20. So what you're gonna see the idea of narrowing and widening pulse pressures, okay? It comes in a few times, so understand if we're talking narrowing and widening pulse pressures, we're talking about this number. Easy way to think about it though, right? If it's a narrowing pulse pressure, right? The pressures are coming closer and closer together, what type of blood pressure do they probably have? If the diastolic and systolic are coming closer and closer to the same number. Yeah, right, they're probably gonna be hypotensive. So a narrowing pulse pressure means they're getting lower in blood pressure. So they're becoming more hypotensive. 
Flip side, if we have a widening pulse pressure that's getting wider number in between, what's happening to their blood pressure? It's going up, right? So you can think of narrowing and widening pulse pressures as just hypo or hypertension, realistically. Um, now, at different scopes, right? If we're like a doctor or a nurse, we might have to pay more attention to that because different things that we can do. But even I don't know that, that's outside my knowledge base, okay? But for the most part, if you can remember, narrowing is hypotension, tension, widening is hypertension, you're gonna be in the same ballpark as everyone in the conversation, okay? Any questions on that? Okay. So blood flow through capillary beds, regulated by capillary sphincters, okay? Under the control of the autonomic nervous system, and they help to regulate the blood flow Right, and they, they, they change that number depending on what our cell needs. Okay, if our cell is a little bit lower in oxygen or a little bit of lower in fuel, like some cells are just not getting the same supply, right, they might be prioritized in that moment. And you're gonna know because it's probably gonna be painful and we'll talk about what that is in a bit. Okay, probably not today. Now, autonomic nervous system, do we control that one? No, right, so this is gonna be the impacts on our vasculature. So this is, if I could give you or ask you, we talked about beta one, beta two, and alpha, right? Out of those three, which one falls under um, the capillary beds? Alpha, beta one, or beta two? Alpha, alpha right, because alpha is vasculature. So this is alpha control, okay? This is gonna be our autonomic, so fight or flight or parasympathetic. Sympathetic or parasympathetic, right? We don't control that, okay? And it helps to regulate blood flow as needs. That's why like when we're in rest and digest, that's when your stomach has time to start moving stool, moving food, start the digestion process. Right? There's no bigger fish to fry. We're not in immediate life-threatening danger, so our body can flip that switch. Time to chill out, okay? Okay, so perfusion also requires, right? We have to have oxygen, oxygen exchange in the lungs, okay? Nutrients, nutrition from the form of glucose and then waste removal primarily through the lungs, but then also like our kidneys, right? Our kidneys excrete urine. Um, our digestive tract excretes stool, right? We're getting rid of all of our waste products. These are also going to be three things that have to be hit for them to be in that perfusion, right? They have to physically bring in, be able to bring air into their lungs, right? Because if they can't bring air in, we can't use air. What do we call it if that happens? We can't bring air in, but we could use that air. Ryan, what's that called? I'm sorry, I was zoned out. No, it's okay. What do you call it when, when the difference between breathing air and using air? What are we worried about? We, uh, you mentioned it this morning uh, to me. VQ ratio, yeah, the VQ mismatch, right? We have to have an even VQ. The V is ventilation, the Q is perfusion, right? We wanna be able to bring air in by ventilating, but we also wanna use the air we've brought in. So the V is ventilating, the Q is perfusion. If we, we have to be able to breathe air in, we have to be able to exchange the gases in our lungs. If one of those two things cannot happen, we're gonna start entering shock. Okay, we're hypoperfusing at that point. We have a VQ mismatch. We want them to be even. We want to use all of the air we breathe in. Okay, does that make sense? Lost anybody yet? Okay. Now, mechanisms are in place to help support the respiratory and cardiovascular system when the need for perfusion of vital organs is increased. Okay, includes the autonomic nervous system and hormones. This is where the idea of shunting comes in. S-H-U-N-T-I-N-G, shunting. You know when you're cold, when you, when you get really, really cold, what's the first things that usually turn blue on you? Your fingers, your toes, what else? Your lips, your nose, right? Are any of those structures incredibly necessary for me to be alive? No, right? The idea of shunting, when our body is in a situation where our body, our organs are failing, the body, the brain's gonna say, you know what? Those fingers, not important right now. You know what's important? Our kidneys. So they'll start drawing all that excess blood that would normally go to your hands. They start redirecting some of it to your internal organs, okay? So this idea of shunting just is basically up and upping the perfusion for the necessary to life organs, okay? Which all of our organs are necessary for life to an extent, but obviously the big ones being heart, lungs, kidneys type things, okay? Liver, I can go on, but you get the point, right? Um, so, any questions on the idea of shunting? Yeah, Robert. Uh, I get the whole shunting thing where it redirects the blood. Um, mm -hmm. Is that kind of a mechanism or beginning sign of um, compensation? Uh, yes, it can be, but I wouldn't call it a beginning sign. 
it's a late sign. Like if you walk up to somebody and they're like, it's summertime and they're, they've been bleeding and they're blue in the lips and fingers, it's probably been a while. They've probably been bleeding there for a little bit. Um, but yeah, it is gonna be a part you'll see for sure. Okay. And then hormones. Um, I'm not even gonna pretend like I know what I'm talking about a ton when it comes to hormones. Uh, endocrinologists, just like neurologists, are amongst the smartest people to walk this planet, and I am not one of them, okay? So we are going to just talk about it at the level of dumb first responders, okay? So hormones are triggered when body senses pressure failing, okay? The, in our body, when we're talking shock hormones, okay, there's two we're really looking at, okay? Cause a increase in heart rate, cause strength of contraction to go up, and it also causes peripheral vasoconstriction. Well, if we're talking beta 1, beta 2, and alpha, those three bullets, what are they? What is the first and second bullet? Beta 1, right? Because it's the heart. Peripheral vasoconstriction falls under what? Alpha, because it's vasculature, right? See how this is starting to line itself up? Now, this is something you'll, you'll hear the idea away from hormones for just a moment. You'll hear the idea of a presser. You'll hear presser out there a lot. When we're talking about a presser, we're talking about something to bring their blood pressure up or their heart rate up. So depending on the situation, will dictate what presser we use. The body has its own set of pressers. In fact, the, the pressers we use as medications are naturally derived in our body. We use epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine, beta-1, beta-2, some alpha. Norepi, primarily alpha, with some beta-1, beta-2. Right, so you see how that works? If, if somebody, like for an example, if someone's in cardiac arrest, right, we get pulses back on this patient. And as I'm looking at his vitals, his pulse rate is, we'll call it 110, okay? But his blood pressure is 80. Do you think I need to bring his heart rate any, any higher than it is? No. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give them norepi because all norepi is gonna do is increase their blood pressure, okay? It just vasoconstricts. By constricting that vascularity, I'm bringing the blood pressure up to match that heart rate a little bit, okay? Flip side of that coin, we have a cardiac arrest patient. When I get to him, his vitals are like 50 pulse, and his blood pressure is like 80 over 60. That's when I'll use epi, right? Because then I can get the heart moving faster and I can start constricting that vasculature. You see how that kind of plays a little bit based on the, the receptors? So nor epi is gonna be an alpha receptor. Epi is gonna be a beta one, beta two primary receptor. Okay, so those are gonna be the hormones that we talk about that increase heart rate, contraction, and vasoconstriction. Beta one, the beta one receptors, their job when they get an epinephrine response is to have the heart rate go up and increase contractility, right? Have stronger contractions because we are not circulating blood effectively enough in that moment. Okay, starting to make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and what's the difference between beta one and two? Beta one is your heart, beta two is your lungs. So beta one is gonna be like heart rate increase, strength of contractility increase. Beta two is gonna be bronchodilation. And then right. Alpha is all related to the heart? Nope, no. vasculature. So remember this way, ace, beta one, one heart, beta two, two lungs, vasculature, arteries start with an A, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and so this response causes all the signs and symptoms of shock, right? Because if our heart rate starts to drop, we're starting to enter shock. If our strength of contraction starts to drop, we start going into shock. If we are vasodilating, not vasoconstricting, we're going into shock. Do you see how all three of those things, if they're not happening, our blood pressure plummets? Right? If our heart rate starts dropping, our pressure goes down. If the contractions start dropping, the pressure goes down because there's not enough strength. If the vasculature is not tight enough, the pressure goes down. So you see how if we, we have to get these functions started just to keep ourselves alive, almost on a daily basis, not even just in shock. Okay, any questions with this concept right here? I know it was a little bit of a muddy one. Okay, everyone seem to get it? Okay. Okay, so causes of shock. So many different shock results, or many different shocks result from three basic causes, right? Pump failure, vessel uh, function, or low fluid volume. Okay, so our heart's not working well, our vasculature is not constricting and dilating appropriately, or we're losing too much fluid, right? Pump, pipes, fluids. All three have to be in place for us to be perfusing. Now, the first one here, just different examples. Uh, pump failure, right? Different causes, heart attack, trauma to heart, obstructive causes, so like PEs, pulmonary embolisms, or the next one, low fluid volume, right? Trauma to vessels or tissues, 
Fluid loss from GI tract, so vomiting, diarrhea. You can get really dehydrated doing both of those activities if you did not know. Okay. Um, also lowers, yeah, you can, even burns would be another one. If someone's covered in burns, has anyone ever burned themselves really good here? Like second degree burn type situation? You know how it kind of gets sticky? Do you know what that sticky stuff is? The fluid coming out, not water. Plasma. It's plasma. Burns will dehydrate you very, very fast too, right? Because our plasma is what makes our blood wet. So if we're losing plasma through our skin, it's no longer in our blood, right? So that can start dehydrating you also. And then we have poor vessel function, right? So if we had a massively vasodilated, so things like infections, drug overdoses, spinal cord injuries, and anaphylaxis are all dilatory type shocks. Okay, they're vasodilating when we don't wanna be vasodilating. Because what happens to our blood pressure if we vasodilate? Sophia, what happens to our blood pressure if we vasodilate? It drops, very good, very good. I know all your names now, so I'm gonna start calling people out personally, you're in trouble. And we'll talk about these in a moment. Once again, I'm not gonna go over the tables. Okay, so we're gonna start getting into the different types of shock. You're gonna need to be able to identify what system is involved based on the type of shock you think. Now, the nice thing is a lot of the shock types are named pretty easily. Cardiogenic shock, any guesses on where that the problem is, right? So you guys will be able to put them together. The big thing is you got to start thinking there's going to be several conditions listed under each type of shock. And these are just general conditions, but they're the big ones. Okay. So you guys are going to need to start associating which condition to which type of shock. Okay. So cardiogenic shock caused by inadequate function of the heart, right? So it's a pump problem. A major effect is the backup of blood into pulmonary vessels and the resulting buildup of pulmonary fluid is called pulmonary edema. So our body has a very unique system, not that unique if we're being frank, right? An in and an outdoor. Our body has several in and outdoors, right? We don't have a in and outdoor, right? Well, I mean, I've digressed, um, but we only have one, like an in or an out, right? Well, if our out is blocked, what do you think our option is? Shoot it in reverse, right? So when we're talking about heart failure in the pulmonary vessels, so if the heart starts to fail for whatever reason, there's, all, there's a number of reasons, but I'll just use CHF because it's a common one. <clears throat> but that heart gets a little flabby. It's having a hard time pumping blood forward. Okay, so if blood can't go forward, it's gonna start overfilling that ventricle. If it still can't go forward, it's gonna start forcing its way backwards, okay? Well, if we follow the blood path, the left ventricle is, block, is all blocked up. Where's it gonna go backwards to? The left atria, right? From the left atria is gonna go through what as it backs up? Pulmonary arteries into where? The lungs, right? So basically you're backing up that blood because it can't go forward. It starts going backwards. And when it gets into the lungs, our lungs become so oversaturated with this blood. that's like, we don't know what to do with this fluid. So it starts taking some of that fluid into its own alveoli to make space for the oxygen CO2 exchange to start happening. Okay, well, that's not a right phrasing. It doesn't take it, it's basically pushed, right? That fluid, because the back pressure is so hard, is pushing fluid back into the alveoli. So instead of that CO2 and oxygen exchange happening per normal, the CO2 is leaving the lungs or getting from blood to the lungs, but so is some fluid every single time until they basically their alveoli fill up with fluid and then they're essentially drowning in their own tissues, okay? It does happen. That's known as pulmonary edema. When we talk about edema, we're talking about fluid shifts, okay? It's all about shifting fluid. Now, it's kind of a tough concept to break apart sometimes when you guys think of like, let me just ask you this. If you hurt yourself, if I sprain my ankle, what's gonna happen to my ankle? It's gonna swell up, right? Has anyone ever seen edematous ankles before? Oh boy, let's ruin some stuff. Um, they look super, super swollen. Who would have thunk? Um, pedal edema. Oh man, I have not looked at these pictures, so who knows what we're getting into. Yeah, this is a good example. That pedal, it just looks super swollen, right? But that's fluid. That's fluid that's backlogged into there to the point that if it gets bad enough, you'll have what's called pitting edema. So if you put like this right here, pitting edema, that's, they're so edematous that someone pushed in on their skin and then left a fingerprint. Okay, they feel like a Tempur-Pedic ma Tempur mattress when they have this pedal edema, yeah. Can this occur with like just larger people? 
Well, let me just hypothetically ask you, um, we're talking larger people, like big people, what would you put their, their scale of health zero to 10, right? Yeah. So they're probably not healthy individuals at baseline, and then things like sodium retention, right? If you're eating lots of salty foods, you're holding lots of fluid, if you have too much fluid, where's it gonna go? They're gonna make space, usually their feet, okay? Good question. Sorry if that sounded really snide when I responded. That was not my intention. Um, but yeah, so the, the big effect we're, we're worried about is that backing up of blood, okay? So cardiogenic shock develops when the heart cannot maintain sufficient output to meet demands of the body. The heart is not able to put enough blood out to satisfy the perfusion requirements of our cells, okay? So once again, cardiac output depends on adequate contractility of the heart muscle. We want the heart making sure it's beating effectively every time. We have to have a decent amount of blood in there, right? We gotta have that blood to pump out or the preload. We've filled that ventricle before it's gonna contract, right? And then you're gonna need resistance to flow in peripheral circulation. You're gonna have that afterload, okay? We wanna create that, that, that refilling, right? By that refilling, it's causing us another pressure wave to keep that pulling itself along, okay? All three need to be met. Um, so I think the way this, I gotta remember, the way this lecture breaks down, we're gonna go over each type of shock and then we'll talk about conditions after, okay? So cardiogenic shock, just remember, it's a pump problem, okay? The next one is obstructive shock, okay? Well, if we're talking obstruction, right? If there's a road obstruction, what does that mean for that road? It's blocked, right? You can't go that way. So if we're talking obstructive shock, we're talking about blockages or things of that nature. Something is being blocked from doing its job, okay? So caused by a, me blah, 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 blah. Caused by a mechanical obstruction that pre prevents an adequate volume of blood from filling the heart chambers, right? Something is going on, it's mechanically obstructing. When we're talking mechanical, we're talking the actual organ tissue itself. We're talking the actual organ, okay? Like, um, that's a good way I can phrase this. So like when we use a pacer on people, like if we are gonna use a pacemaker, we can make our own pacer on our monitor. We look for two things. We look for electrical capture and mechanical capture. Electrical capture is on their monitor. Okay, there's one line, one shock, every heartbeat. But mechanical capture is okay, there's now a pulse for every one of those lines, right? So when we talk mechanical, we're talking the actual body, the structure of the body. Make sense? Okay. So, um, ba -ba -ba -ba. so three most common examples cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and pulmonary embolism. Those are going to be our three big obstructive shocks. Now, Cardiac tamponade could kind of fall into cardiogenic shock just because of the influence on the heart, but we'll talk about it when we get to there, okay? But cardiac tamponade, tension pneumo, and pulmonary embolism. Can somebody tell me what a tension pneumo is or what a pneumo is? Pneumothorax. A what? In the thorax, in the lungs. Yeah, well, so well, a pneumothorax is a collapsed lung. Yeah, collapsed lung. And then what's a pulmonary embolism? Anyone know? I know you know. What is it, Ryan? What is it? Yeah, it's a blockage of the pulmonary artery. Yeah, it's a blood clot in the vasculature of the lungs. It's not in the, the air pipes of the lung, it's in the blood pipes of the lung. So we have a blockage blocking the blood from getting to the alveoli, and if they can't get to the alveoli, what are they not putting in their system? Oxygen, right? See how we start entering shock already? Because we're starting to break our perfusion triangle. So cardiac tamponade. Um, this is a really interesting kind of condition. So usually caused by trauma, blunt or penetrating, but blunt is typical. Um, if you guys are interested, there's gonna be this thing, I'm gonna erase it. Yeah, Hayden. I just had a question, so shock mm -hmm. for a, a stroke is the brain, so that's not, would that fall under shock? It, it could, you could, you could argue it. Um, well, do you know what's happening for a stroke? It kind of depends on what type of stroke we're dealing with. Like if we're talking a ischemic stroke where it's like a blockage, you could argue obstructive shock, right? If it's a hemorrhagic stroke, we'll talk about it, but you could argue hypovolemic shock as well. Um, so yeah, it, it would be just depending on the type. 
But for the most part, a lot, it just depends on the time frame. is the big one. I mean, we'll talk about it with strokes times of the essence anyway. Um, but especially with the timing of like, how long was, were they exposed to that? Is, are they gonna go into a shock-like reaction? Is guess what I'm kind of looking for. Is that answer kind of Hayden? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So if you go a long enough period of time being in shock, can you start to experience multiple types of shock all at once? That's just organ failure. Your body's just, you're dying actively. Okay, so pericardial or cardiac tamponade, otherwise known as pericardial tamponade. I'm just gonna do this because I don't feel like drawing an anatomic heart. So. We got our heart, right? Now, do you guys remember the layers of tissue that surround our lungs? You guys remember what those are called? What are they? The parietal and, and what? There's two words, and then I want to know what type of tissue. Parietal and blank, blank. Visceral, you guys remember that? Parietal, visceral, pleura. The tissue that surrounds our lungs, the, the visceral side is organ side, the parietal side is body side, if we talked about that. I feel like we have. Okay, well, we have tissues surrounding all of the, all of our, oh my God. We have tissues surrounding all of our organs, okay? Especially our important ones, because they need that kind of layer of defense, right? If they're important for us to be alive, then we need to protect them. Our heart is no different. We have what is called a pericardial sac, okay? So we have this, this sac that kind of lives, our heart lives in a balloon, essentially, okay? And there's holes, obviously, for the vasculature to come out. So what happens during cardiac tamponade is something happened to the heart. There was some sort of, I'll use purple, purple is blood. There was some sort of impact to the heart or there was leaking vasculature, but we are putting blood inside of this sac, okay? We are starting to fill this sac up with blood here. Well, if we were to take two water balloons and we put one water balloon, kind of like maybe a quarter filled, inside of a bigger water balloon and we filled that water balloon up, water balloon up what is the pressure going to do to that inside balloon it's going to start squeezing it right same idea if our heart starts to fill or that pericardial sac starts to fill with blood it's going to put pressure down on our heart to the point it's squeezing our heart that it can no longer fully expand well if it can't fully expand do you think our cardiac output is very good no, because we're not pulling enough blood into that ventricle to send it on its way, right? So this is the beginning of a shock. So collection of fluid between the pericardial sac and the myocardium. Myocardium means heart muscle. Myo means muscle, cardium, heart, right? So direct for the heart muscle and becomes large enough to prevent ventricles from filling with blood. If they can't fill with blood, they can't pump blood forward, okay? Often caused by blunt trauma or penetrating trauma, and then signs and symptoms are referred to as Beck's triad. That's the next big thing I want you guys to know. There's gonna be another picture of this guy up there. Beck's triad, there's, so full disclosure, there's two triads you guys are gonna be really expected to memorize. And when I say memorize, commit them to memory for real because these were questions I got on my testing for even just getting a job, okay? So Beck's triad, there's three things we're looking for, okay? First thing we're looking for is high uh, po tension. I got it backwards for a second. Hypo tension. Okay, we're gonna start losing blood pressure, right? Because the heart can't fully expand. If it can't fully expand, it can't pump all its blood out. So the pressure is gonna start to drop. Okay. The next thing you're gonna note is muffled heart tones. Okay, so, which also makes sense, right? You guys have all listened to somebody's heart, I'm assuming at this point in time, you put your ear to their chest and you've heard the lub dub, the big dub sound you hear, the loud sound is the ventricle contracting. Well, if the sac that covers our heart is filling with fluid, can you guys talk underwater very well? No, right? So same thing, the sound doesn't transfer very well. So when you go, if you go to listen to the heart, it's gonna sound a little muffled, like it's in water, okay? And the last one is three letters, and I'll explain what they are in a second. J, V, D, okay? If you wanna know what those stand for, I'll say them right now. They are jugular vein distension. Jugular vein distension. So Beck's triad is hypotension, muffled heart tones, and J, V, D. Now, what does distension mean? Yeah, it's like poking out, right? Like someone's stomach is distended, like they're bloated, it's kind of poking out. Jugular veins, right? The ones in our neck. So what do you think JVD means? 
Yeah, jugular veins are poking out. You know when like someone's, uh, I use a lot of poop analogies in here, I gotta stop that. You know when someone's like deadlifting and you can see like the, the veins in their neck starting to pop out like really aggressively? Uh, you see where I'm going with the pooping analogy now, right? Um, but, yeah. but you know when you see those neck veins coming out? That looks like JVD. Okay, the difference between JVD though and just that act, like exercise is the activity, right? If someone's exercising, sure, it makes sense for the vasculature to be popping out a little bit. If someone's been sitting on their couch for the last five hours and we walk in and their neck veins are popping out, that's a different conversation, right? There's nothing to warrant that. The reason JVD shows up is the whole concept of exits and entrances. If we can't use the exit, we gotta go backwards, right? Well. Same thing, from, if we go from the lungs, right? So the, the ventricle backs up, left ventricle backs up to left atria, backs up to the lungs, which then backs up through the lungs to the right atria, to the right ventricle, right? And then it's gonna start backing up the vena cavas. So you're gonna have so much back pressure in your vena cava that it's gonna cause these neck veins to start popping out, okay? Which is why like, when we, I was showing you guys those different collars, right? We had the soft collar that, uh, I, have, I don't know where the other one went. But I had the soft collar, and then I have like this guy right here. This is the reason nobody liked those soft collars, because we couldn't see their throat. So if someone was going downhill, we couldn't see JVD. That's why a lot of them moved out of popularity very, very quick. Any questions on Beck's triad? Once again, you are going to be expected to memorize that, and we'll go over the other one today. Okay, all I would, if I was you, commit to memory is Beck's triad is for cardiac tamponade. They mean one and the same, okay? If you see Beck's triad, you're gonna see cardiac tamponade. And now as far as treatments of cardiac tamponade go, that's a hospital treatment. It was within the paramedic scope for a long time. It's called pericardial synthesis. Essentially, we take a needle that's like this long and we put it underneath your xiphoid process and we go into your heart, into the heart sac itself and we would pull that fluid out. Um, it's since left the scope just because of infection, right? And especially if we're talking infection straight to the heart, that's kind of a bad, bad combo. Yeah. Uh, with the cardiac tamponade, is JVD have a sign that it's, it's a late? It's a late sign as well. Had chest trauma, and you have already been suspecting the, like the possibility of it. You're like in transport, you notice their blood pressure start to drop, or you starting to look like listen to heart again to see if they have heart tamponade, or are you just. Mm, I mean, here's full transparency: is I never listened to heart tones unless it was cardiac arrest okay. as a confirming. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things I kept in the back of my mind based on the mechanism. And if I started to see vital changes, now remember I looked at vital changes differently than you did because I can correct blood pressures, right? So I would just start fixing the problem as they would arise. Um, for you guys, it's just gonna be a, you know, just get there, just, if it's in the back of your mind as a potential, just go, because is there anything you can really do about it? All right. Um, yeah, and so JVD just in general is a really late sign. There's another, there's other conditions where JVD is associated. Um, there's another, like um, uh, pulmonary embolism is another one. Um, there's another type of sign that's really late. It's called tracheal deviation, but we'll talk about that when we get to PEs in a moment, okay? So the next one, tension pneumothorax. Before we get to the tension quality, a pneumothorax, right, a popped lung caused by damage to lung tissue, and then the air normally held within our lungs is now filling our chest cavity, right? Now remember, all of our cavities are perfectly designed for the amount of pressure they have in them. Right, so extra stuff is too much pressure for those organs, okay? So if we're having air leave our lung, it's starting to fill our chest cavity, right? It's gonna start crumpling down one of those lungs, okay? So that lung collapses and air applies pressure to the organs, including the heart and great vessels. There's another way you'll see this. Do you guys remember what that invisible line is from sternum to here? You guys remember what that's called? It starts with an M, what? Nope, not midline. Does mediastinum r ring any bells? The mediastinum, the, the thing in the middle of our chest that has the great vessel, or the invisible line in the middle of our chest, our great vessels, our trachea, our esophagus, our heart all live in there. Okay, does it sound familiar? Yes, no, yeah, no? Huh? The mediastinum. So mediastinum. Mediastinum. 
So the mediastinum is an invisible line on our chest. And in, our, in that line comprises a few organs, our great vessels, so our aorta and our vena cavas, our heart, our esophagus, and our trachea. Which chest organ did I not say in that list? What was it? The lungs. Why do you think I didn't include the lungs? Bingo. It's a middle line. Where do our lungs live? Either side, right? So you'll see this from time to time saying the mediastinum is deviated laterally. If we're pushing all of our organs to one side, we're putting pressure on our heart and our lungs as well. Okay. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I want you to understand the idea of a pneumothorax because if you understand a pneumo, attention will make more sense. So if someone has a collapsed lung and I go to listen to lung sounds, do you think I'm going to hear equal and bilateral lung sounds? No. One side will have lung sounds, one will be diminished. What do you think that means for their chest rise? Unilateral, right? Only the good side is going to be moving. That's during a normal pneumo. Okay. Now, a normal pneumo will progress to a tension pneumo when that pressure starts to apply to the heart and to the other lung. Okay, because that air is starting to squeeze down on the heart, and if we have pressure on our heart, what's it not doing well? It's not filling well, and if it can't fill well, what does it, what does it not do? It doesn't pump well, right? If there's no, not enough to fill, there's not enough to pump. Okay, so a tension pneumothorax is when a pneumothorax progresses to the point that is putting pressure on the heart and lungs, and you're going to see an impact in one vital sign, or at least you'll see an impact in one for sure. Any guesses on what that is? Or what? Breathing. Not our breathing. Well, breathing, yeah, I guess, if you want to get technical, their lung popped. But another one, there's a new development. A new vital sign starts to change. What happens to our heart if there's pressure put on it? Weaker. What was that? Weaker. It's weaker, right? It can't fully expand. So what vital sign is going to start dropping? Our blood pressure. So a tension pneumothorax is when a pneumothorax gets so bad that it starts to impact our blood pressure. It's not just a pulmonary problem anymore. It's becoming a systemic problem because it's starting to disrupt our heart as well. Okay, so a pneumothorax, we have air escaping the lung into the chest cavity, filling up, collapsing the lung. If it's been there for a while and it gets bad enough, it's gonna start pushing on that mediastinum and it's gonna drop their blood pressure as well, okay? So that tension pneumo is a drop in blood pressure, yeah? Would the heart rate increase? It's gonna to attempt to. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get to, to the treatment side of compensatory on this. <clears throat> Any other questions with tension for now? Okay, we're going to touch on it again, I think, in a little bit. Okay, so PE, pulmonary embolism, a blood clot that blocks the flow of blood through pulmonary vessels. So a PE, a pulmonary embolism, is in the blood vessels. It's not in the lung itself. Okay, now I'm going to teach you guys a secret handshake. And I'm going to tell you what each one of those things means later. Okay, so to do the secret handshake, you go like this, and then you go like this. Okay, boom, boom. So we're talking about this, right? Pulmonary embolism. So we've got a clot in our lungs. So if I'm going here, what do you think I'm talking about a clot where? What if I've got up here, what do you think I'm talking about up here? What do you think it's called when you have a blood clot in your heart? Generally saying, heart a heart attack. What do you, if you've got a blood clot in your brain, what do we call that? A stroke, right? So pulmonary embolism, heart attack, stroke. Boom, boom. All caused by obstruction. Okay. So um, some of these can get really big, just depending. Now, if massive can result in a complete backup of blood in the right ventricle, right? If there's a complete blockage in our lung and our right ventricle can no longer pump blood through the lung to the left atria, it's going to start backing itself up. Okay. And if it starts backing up to the right ventricle, then it starts to back up to the right atria, and then it's just a compounding problem, okay? This is another time that you could see JVD, right? If that right ventricle backs up, the right atria backs up, all that's left is the vena cavas, and there we are, right? JVD, okay? Um, pulmonary, pulmonary embolisms can be a little tricky. They present really weird in people. Um, I've, I'll teach you guys the same textbook thing that I learned, but I can tell you that the textbook is not super realistic to real life. So what I was taught when identifying a PE is they're gonna have pinpoint chest pain. They're gonna be like, yep, it hurts right here. They're gonna have clear lung sounds and they're gonna have a low SpO2. Why are the lung sounds clear? 
Because what? Exactly. It's blocking the vasculature. It's not blocking the lung itself. It's blocking the blood flow, right? Um, so pinpoint chest pain, clear lung sounds, and a low SBO2. Um, the demographics that you're kind of worried about tends to be women, people with DVTs. Does anyone know what a DVT is? A deep vein thrombosis. So anyone's ever seen like their grandma or great grandma, they have like a purple line just on their leg. It means they got a blood clot in their leg. And a lot of people, older, older gals, a lot of times get them. Uh, other things, recent surgeries, right? After you have a surgery, what's your body trying to do? It's trying to heal, right? But by healing, what does it form? Clots, right? So surgeries put you at risk. And then a really big one, stagnant lifestyles, right? If you're someone who doesn't leave your chair a whole lot, you run the risk of forming DVTs, which form the risk of pulmonary embolisms. Okay, um, now women, the reason it's with women, honestly, it's, it tends to be uh, younger gals, mm, younger, like I'd say probably 30s to mid-teens, um, because of one thing that they start taking usually around their teenage years. Does anyone have any guesses what females take? Birth control. Birth control pills throw hormones out of whack in women in general, but they also increase the risk of PEs, okay? So ladies, look into that if you're on birth control. Um, but yeah, you can have uh, some pretty bad complications because of that. The only reason I'm, I'm pushing this a little bit is because my wife, Allie, I'll say her name because you guys will hear it a lot. Allie um, ran a call for a gal who's like 17. She ended up having nine PEs at the same time and she had just swapped birth control pills. So that's what the doctors thought was going on. Okay, so things do happen. Just keep that in mind. There are side effects with everything we do. Any questions on PEs so far? Okay. Yeah. If you don't really know, that's fine too. I'm, I'm the smartest man alive. Well, I'm, I'm curious <laughs> when you, when they do arrive to the hospital, what um, how do they like operate on your lungs? They cut that's they crazy. cut you open and they pull it out, or they'll or they'll go in through vasculature. Okay. Mm -hmm. And some of these can get really big, and it's kind of cool, like because sometimes they pull them out whole, um, and they yeah they they'll map out um, basically their vasculature. Um, pulmonary embolism, not in real life, uh, blood clot. I, I, did, I would not want to be there in the, these things get gross. I want to see a real one where you is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Google's like, trust me, dude. Yeah. Whoa, yeah. All right. Crazy. Neat. Neato, gang. Yeah, so you can get some pretty gnarly clot development that traces your entire vasculature. Do you think you can breathe through that stuff? No, because it's in your vasculature. <laughs> so it's not like that severe. Right? Uh -huh. so you just have like this like, clot down your vein, mm -hmm. DVT. Mm -hmm. How does it turn into this massive thing that like stretches through all the bronchioles? Just, well, think about it this way. Blo blood when it becomes stagnant, what does it do? It right, so if, if you got a blockage, everything behind it's gonna coagulate. Um, and DVTs put you at the biggest risk of PEs if we think about that super highway of blood that we circulate, right? If we have a deep vein thrombosis, if that breaks loose, where's it gonna go? From the, the leg, uh, vein in my leg, where's it gonna move? What's the next big place? To the, heart. to the heart. But before we get to the heart, what's the first place? Through the vena cava. The vena cava, right? So it's, it's coming back through a vein. Well, if we think about that pathway, so from the vena cava to the right atria, that clot makes it through. Right atria, right ventricle, that clot makes it through. Right uh, ventricle out through that pulmonary arch to the lungs, sends it out, gets stuck, right? So you see how if you just follow the highway, you can tell where things are gonna land. Same thing with like when we talk about heart attacks and strokes, a lot of times it's because they have a clot on their left side. So if they have a clot in their left atria, it moves to the left ventricle and gets shot out, our heart gets blood first from our heart, or from the atria, oh my God, our blood gets, our heart gets blood first from the aorta, right? So that clot can slip through there. But if it misses that, what if it goes up the carotid artery? Where is it gonna land, right? So you, if you follow the highway of vasculature, you can figure out where clots are gonna go. That's why I push this so hard for you guys. If you guys understand that concept of how blood circulates, a lot of stuff starts to make sense, okay? Okay, uh, we will move on. Yeah, we'll move on for the moment, we'll come back to it. Uh, the next type of shock, shock, distributive shock, results from widespread dilation of small arterioles, small venules, or both. 
What happens when our vasculature dilates? What happens to our blood pressure? Goes, no, nope, other way. Down, yeah. Constrict it goes up, dilate goes down, right? So if everything is massively dilating at the same time, what do you think our blood pressure is doing? It's swimming its way down that toilet, right? So circulating blood volume pools in the expanded vascular beds, and then this will decrease tissue perfusion. If we do not have the blood in the vasculature, it is not going to be exchanging CO2 and oxygen. And if you get to the point your, your vasculature dilates too far, you're actually just gonna start leaking blood through your vasculature and can cause immense amounts of, swe of uh, swelling. Well, based on leaking vasculature, immense amounts of swelling, right? What type of shock do you think this is gonna be? I'll give you a hint, peanuts or bees. Anaphylaxis, right? Because their neck gets all swollen, their mouth gets all swollen. That's blood leaving vasculature and forcing its own space. Okay. Yeah, so distributive shock, um, anaphylaxis would be one of them. First one, though, we'll talk about septic shock. So, occurs as a result of severe infections in which toxins are generated by bacteria or by infected body tissues. Toxic damage vessel toxins damage vessel walls causing increased cellular permeability, and vessel walls leak and are unable to contract well. So, what do you think the word cellular permeability means? What's permeable mean? Yeah, something can go through. So we're increasing cellular permeability. We are allowing more blood to pass through the cells than we want, okay? We're gonna start offloading and pushing cells out. Now, with, sepsi with sepsis, in real life, what was that? Infections. Yeah, what about it? Okay, so, oh, I thought you were asking me questions. Oh, no. <laughs> was, you're right, yeah, it's infections. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, uh, with sepsis in real life, it can be really tough to identify, okay? Um, you're gonna show up, someone's gonna probably be less than conscious. They'll probably be, if they're conscious, they're gonna be out of it. But you're gonna feel them and they're gonna feel hot to the touch. And you're gonna have a few different things jump to your head at that moment. Is this like an illness, right? Do they have like a cold, flu, fever? Or do they have an infection, right? What do you think a good question you can ask to differentiate those two is about the patient? How do we get infections? Say it again, loud. Open wounds. Open wounds. So what do you think we can look and ask our patient if we're trying to discern? Do you have any open wounds, any injuries? Yeah. Um, only reason I bring that up is because my wife just ran a call on a sepsis patient that they were unsure what was going on with him. And then she felt him and she's like, he felt hot, like noticeably even just walking in, like touching him. And she asked the caregiver, does he have any cuts or anything? And she's like, yeah, his legs are covered in him. Sure, his leg was super, super infected, right? So you can hunt down sepsis um, origins by looking for their injury patterns, okay? Because remember, any sort of open wound can cause an infection. Okay, now, same time, don't let that scare you too much for your own jobs out there. If you don't have any cuts on your hands, you could put your hand elbow deep in HIV blood and not get sick. Don't test it, but you could. Also, good luck finding that much blood. But, I digress. Um, so many more questions to this. But, right, you, your skin is a good barrier. So you guys are gonna be okay. Don't freak yourselves out that you're gonna get sepsis the second you get a cut, right? But understand when we're investigating on a patient, we can find these things pretty quickly. Okay, especially when we're dealing with people who are like chronically living at home and they, they're bed bound, they got bed sores and things like that, right? You're gonna see every demographic of people, okay? The homeless included, right? They're gonna have these type of injuries. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big one, just as long as the, the wound was not kept clean, okay? Okay, so when we're talking sepsis, generalized is widespread dilation of vessels and combination of plasma loss through vessel walls resulting in shock. So. Our vasculature super dilates, okay? That cellular permeability increases, so more things can start leaving the cell or the, the vasculature, and then plasma is gonna start leaking out, okay? And that plasma is gonna be what gives you that swelling appearance, okay? But that plasma is also warm. Remember, blood does some things for our body, gives us color and temperature. So when you feel that swollen spot and that plasma, it's gonna feel warm, okay? Uh, the next type of distributive shock, neurogenic shock, okay? Now, usually with neurogenic shock, this is the result of a high spinal cord injury. So we're talking more neck, 
okay, upper back, neck. Uh, nerve impulses to blood vessels below the level of injury are blocked, and then all vessels cut off from nerve impulses will dilate, causing the blood to pool, okay? So there's this idea, we'll, we'll, I'll show you one later, I think when we get to neuro, but there's this idea in neurology called dermatomes, okay? Remember, we, just, we have two spinal nerves coming off of each one of our vertebrae, right? So dermatomes are these lines of feeling, and I believe it's like C, no, not C, I think it's like T1 or T2, maybe T3, but that's the, the nipple line, okay? So like if you break T3, you lose all sensation from the nipple line down, okay? Versus, and then as you keep going up, right, if you broke like C7, that line jumps from nipple line to like clavicle line, right? You see how those nerves, as we break upward, you lose feeling higher and higher and higher. Um, so with neurogenic shock, the idea of dermatomes kind of plays a role. They have a high spinal cord injury, so the, the nerve impulses to blood vessels are gonna be blocked. Our, our brain cannot tell our blood vessels, hey, we should constrict. Our blood pressure is starting to drop, we should constrict, okay? The body's gonna start plummeting, uh, plummeting blood pressure until there's a reverse re reaction. I'll tell you what that is later when we talk about it. But basically all the vessels are cut off from nerve impulses, which is gonna cause dilation, causing a, the blood to pool, okay? Um, yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it. So another thing with, there's another triad coming up, but it's, it kind of has to do with neurogenic shock, but it's more head injury based. It has to do with pressure, so we won't get into it too quick. Okay, so neurogenic shock causing blood to pool. Then we have our anaphylactic shock. It occurs when a person reacts violently to a substance to which he or she has been sensitized. Okay, sensitization means becoming sensitive to a substance that did not initially cause a reaction and then each subsequent exposure tends to produce a more severe reaction. Do I have anyone who's got anaphylactically or is anaphylactically allergic to anything? Do you mind if I ask what you're allergic to? I forget the medical terms, but I'm sure I'll learn. Um, essentially anything that's not Tylenol. So like NSAIDs. Ibuprofen, Advil, yeah, yeah. yeah non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Yeah, NSAIDs, okay. Yeah, so have you, I'm assuming you've taken them before and you've found out? Mm -hmm. You just took one and it. swelled up? I took one for three exams, actually. Mm -hmm. And it was my first week of cosmetology school. <laughs> it's a leave. Solid start. Solid start. Um, well, her story didn't help me, so I'm going to tell my own now. Um, I have a friend of mine who, well, was a friend of mine. I don't want to get into that. But he was allergic to strawberries. <laughs> the problem is, is that he loved strawberries. And, but when he would eat them, he wouldn't get anaphylactically allergic. We, like, he was doing this through like middle school, high school. His mouth would get itchy. He'd eat them, and so he'd sit there just for like the next four hours. Well, we, we did that from like middle school on. And then we were, I think, just graduated college, and he ate strawberries again. He's like, I'm just going to itch my mouth. And he went full-blown anaphylaxis. Okay, so if you're allergic to something, stop playing that game because each time you expose yourself, you get worse. Okay, and the funny thing about allergies is they can just show up out of the blue, right, Megan? They just pop up. Um, and the nice thing about them too, is sometimes they just go away. Um, I had a roommate in college who his whole life was anaphylactically allergic to dairy products. And then he comes back for, I think it was my senior year, his junior year, he comes back and he's like, guess what? I'm not allergic to cheese anymore. I was like, guess what? We're going to Taco Bell. You're getting diarrhea today. And sure enough, he ate so much of that cheese. But they can go away, right? They can go away over time too. That's kind of a neat thing. You can outgrow them. Um, some people are less lucky. Just understand with, with allergies, they can be really dependent on the person also. I have a friend who is anaphylactically allergic to peanuts to the point where like, we worked at a gym together and when she showed up to the gym, she was just enormous. And I was like, what happened to you? And then immediately the ambulance showed up and she left. But she gave me the story later. She uh, was driving, she had a soft top Jeep. She took the, the top down, driving down the road. Someone flicked a peanut out of their car and it landed in her lap and went full blown anaphylactic, right? So it depends on the person. <laughs> yeah, bad luck, bad luck. Karma is really gonna get her. I'm pretty sure she earned it at some point, but you know. Wait, what's that again? What's the difference between an allergic Oh, that's a good question. So differences between allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. So a lot of people, example, are allergic to like metals, right? If they wear like the wrong metal, like for me when I was a kid, if I wore like the wrong metal and the, the snap rubbed on my stomach, I'd get a rash, right? But it was isolated to that one spot. I got a rash, like if you're allergic to 
whatever, and you rub it on your arm and you get a rash in that one spot. It's isolated, right? It's just your skin. The difference between anaphylaxis and allergic, and this is gonna be a test question later. The difference between an allergic reaction and anaphylaxis is multiple systems. So an, an anaphylactic reaction is an allergic reaction that is affecting two or more systems, right? So if we're talking um, anaphylaxis, if someone's neck starts to swell, what system is infected at that, or affected at that point? If their airway is starting to swell. Their respiratory system, right? Well, let's say at the same time, they're covered in hives. What system is that? You can just say the general word if you don't know it. Yes, Skin, integumentary system, right? So that's two systems. So we already got anaphylaxis. Another one that a lot of people get is GI complaints as well. They start nausea, vomiting, diarrhea when they get um, exposed to their allergen. Okay, so if you've got swelling in your neck, your skin's breaking out in hives and you're diarrhea or vomiting, right? That's full-blown anaphylaxis. So the difference is two or more, two or more systems. Good question. Okay, any other questions on anaphylaxis so far? We have a whole chapter we're gonna talk about anaphylaxis later, okay, about like what really goes on. Okay, the um, next type of shock, psychogenic shock. So this is the kind of shock when you guys think like, they're in shock and Mima, like, you know, does like that number, right? That's psychogenic shock. So caused by a sudden reaction of the nervous system, produces temporary generalized vascular dilation, and then results in fainting. Remember, if, if our vasculature dilates at the same time, what happens to our blood pressure? Goes down. Which way does gravity pull on our blood if I'm standing straight up? That's a bad combo, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's why they say they fall out. They done fell out. That's how they say it down south when they pass out. Um, they fell out. Yeah, so psychogenic shock is a, va is a massive vasodilation, and then gravity is working against the blood already leaving their head. So all the blood leaves their brain real quick, and when that happens, you fall down less than conscious. But what happens when you get horizontal? You ping right back up usually, right? Yeah. Uh, potentially, but eh. I would say potentially, but with pain, it would be more of the reaction is like that bearing down. You know, how people like grit through pain. It's probably that because when you're doing that, you're starting to lower your heart rate, which lowers your blood pressure, and then already you're bleeding if you broke something, right? Yeah, because I think that's what happened. Because mm -hmm. I broke my leg mm -hmm. and passed mm -hmm. Yeah, did you look at it? Is that the mistake you made? Oh, usually people look at it, and that's when they pass out. That's like the moment. Um, yeah, it might have been just pain. You bared down too hard and you're probably, you know, stressed out in the moment as well. I totally would check out. I got questions for you, but I'm going to save them for later. Okay, so life-threatening causes of psychogenic shock. An irregular heartbeat and a brain aneurysm. That's really it, okay? Psychogenic shock is typically, unless they fall down and crack their noggin on the floor, right? That kind of changes the ballpark a little bit, the ball game rather, but... As far as life threats go, an irregular heartbeat or a brain aneurysm. You could even extend that to any sort of aneurysm, but at that point, they're, you're actually leaving psychogenic shock and entering the next type we're gonna talk about. Now, non-life-threatening events include receiving bad news, experiencing fear, or unpleasant, unpleasant sights such as blood. Um, I have a buddy. Uh, you guys will actually see a picture of him probably next week. He broke his skull. Um, I got all sorts of good pictures on him. but. He is one of my favorite people to mess with, mostly because he will pass out if you talk about blood. You can see blood, but if he talks about it, he'll pass out. So it's a new game we've been playing for like the last three years. Every time I go to his house, first thing we talk about is blood and <laughs> passes out, put him on his couch, he comes to and yells at us. It's a game we play and it's a good time. Um, he doesn't love it, but I love it. So I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. Okay. So the shock that I was saying right here, right? Uh, irregular heartbeat and brain aneurysm. That leads us more to hypovolemic shock. This is our more standard, like when we think, when I think trauma and I think shock, this is the shock I think of. Hypovolemic, so resulting of an inadequate amount of fluid or volume in the circulatory system. We're losing blood, right? If I cut my hand off, all that blood's going to the outside world. It's not staying in my body. So we're losing the fluid, right? Remember, pump pipes fluid. This is gonna be the one where we're losing fluid. Okay, so there's two types of causes, hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic. Any guesses on what hemorrhagic means? What was it? Blood. Blood, bleeding, yeah. They either be caused by bleeding or non-bleeding non related causes. Um, but it all has to do with fluid, right? So, you know, if somebody is dehydrated and they're outside sweating all day, 
right? That could put them into hypovolemic shock because they're losing all their blood, their, their liquid volumes, right? Diarrhea, um, vomiting, you can lose all of that fluid, right? You're losing all that blood volume because you're just draining yourself of fluid. So you can throw yourself into hypovolemic shock. Um, and then also occurs with severe thermal burns. Why do you think it occurs with severe thermal burns? We talked about it. Because the plasma, right? The, as the plasma is leaving our blood and enter, or exiting our body, we still have to circulate that blood. We have less fluid, so our blood pressure goes down. You see how that works? If we don't have the blood to circulate, the blood pressure is going to go down. Okay, so uh, any questions on the type so far? Yeah. So anaphylactic shock, what? I understand like you lose, uh, it's the plasma that causes it, but what is the reaction? Like, what, like what's causing the reaction? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to debate if I want to go into it right now. We have a chapter on anaphylaxis we'll talk about a little bit more, but basically it's just an overreaction of your immune system. Your immune system, for whatever reason, picks something out it doesn't like, and an anaphylactic reaction is just an overreaction. So it's like you ate peanuts and your body's like, well, guess what? I don't like peanuts, so I'm going to kill you now. That's basically what it does. It's like we're going to, it takes something and just overreactions it. Um, and that's, that's why it's different from person to person. And then there's, there's other factors inside the blood as well. Like we'll talk about like histamine, but I think I want to save it to the medical because I don't want to muddy it up too much for the, what you'll need to know for the benchmark right now. Sorry. <laughs> is, that, is that okay, Hayden? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just don't want to muddy it too much because there's not going to be enough questions at that depth on this benchmark and you guys are just going to forget it. And so may as well just save it. Okay, so progression of, of shock, the stages of shock. This is where we start entering compensated versus decompensated. Okay, so compensated shock is a uh, early stage when the body can still compensate for blood loss, right? We're losing blood. I cut my hand off. My blood is going to the outside world. As I'm doing that, what's happening to my blood pressure? It's going down, right? So what does my body do, you think, to get to that homeostasis line? The heart rate goes up, right? Because, okay, we're losing all our blood volume. We don't know it's blood volume. I just see my blood pressure going down. Let's just beat faster. If we beat faster, our blood pressure goes up. That's usually the way it works, right? This is where I say the body tries to kill itself by fixing its own problems, right? If I cut my hand off and my heart rate goes up, what's that going to make the blood leaving my body do? leave faster, right? So it's a real problem. Um, so compensated shock, the body is still attempting to fix its own problems, okay? And that's gonna go on for a while. That's an early stage, okay? It's gonna go on for as long as the patient can really tolerate based on their own physiology and anatomy. And then it'll get to a point where the heart's like, I'm pretty pooped, I'm pretty tired, I think I'll go home now, right? So it starts to, to slow down. And as it slows down, the blood pressure continues to fall. So now we are just working our way into cardiac failure, right? Because not only are we losing pressure, we're losing the fluid because we had a pipe uh, breach, right? We had a faulty pipe, we're losing fluid. It's gonna cause the pump to start to fail. Do I have anyone in here who's like a sprinklers person and understands sprinkler systems pretty well? Like pumps and things of that nature? It's the same way. If you can put those correlations together, right? Like for me, I have a pump system irrigation. I have a pump, I have pipes, I have water. If something was, if I wasn't getting water pressure out on my sprinkler, it was either a pump or a pipe problem because I, I could check the water line. So you see how you can investigate this in different ways? Um, a lot of people, it helps to think of the human body as kind of a machine. If you can think of it as a machine, the only thing I kind of caution you is don't get to the point where you start treating people like they're machines. Um, that's when you hear about like bad bedside manner from doctors, a lot of times they start viewing their patients as just the piece of equipment they got to deal with in the moment, okay? So I caution you. Um, I have a story on that too, but I'll, I won't talk about it right now. So now when it comes to the differences between compensated and decompensated shock, there is no way to assess when effects are irreversible, okay? Remember what I said early in the beginning of this lecture, shock is really, really hard to identify. So when you show up, if the mechanism lines up, you look at them, it's like, well, they got in a car wreck, they were kicked out of their car, they look pale and bad. You should just assume we need to start treating for shock. Okay, the, mecha ooh, the mechanism will give a lot away about what we need to do. S can't sneak up on me like that. Never sneak up on a man who's been in a chemical fire. Um, 
So, uh, and then must recognize and treat shock early. It's tough, it is tough. This is where reading your mechanism and just having that kind of social awareness of a moment, right? You walk in, it's like, that guy looks bad. You can identify that. Even if you walk into like, a, you know, one of us was sick in here and you walk in and be like, well, they look sick today, right? You guys are able to identify that stuff. If that, if the mechanism based on your call notes, right? You're dispatched to a motor vehicle collision. Okay, that's a pretty good mechanism, right? I show up, my patient's pale, sweaty, not looking very good. Let's just get them on the cot. Let's get them, start treating for shock. Okay, get ahead of it. Cause you can get behind the eight ball and really, really quick. Yeah, Isaac. Um, cover them with the blanket, conserve body heat, provide them oxygen, lay them supine. So the reason we do a supine, right? Think about once again, like when we talked about, or I was talking about passing out, right? If I'm standing up, which way is gravity pulling on my blood, right? Pulling it out of my head. If we lay them flat, it's pulling it to the back of their head, right? But it's still circulating through their brain. So that's why we got to keep them flat. And then oxygen, because if they're in shock, right? That's going to be one of the things that we're going to lose quickly for our perfusion triangle. So we're going to supply that. And then body temperature is big, just because they got to maintain. They ha you have to maintain your body temperature to keep your vasculature and everything working normally. So as they start getting cold, everything starts to slow down. Well, we don't want their body functions to slow down, right? While they're already dying, it's kind of a bad combo. So you need those three. Okay. Yeah. Is there any reason you won't treat everyone for shock? Like if, if you, mm, it it's very situ. I mean, realistically. Let me, how do I want to phrase this? About, I'd say about 80 to 85 of my patients, my, and what I did every time, it's like, okay, we'll take you to the hospital, even if they weren't that sick. Put them on the gurney, cover them with a blanket. That was already the first step, you know? And then all I'd have to do to treat for shock is that, you know, drop them and put the oxygen on. And half the time, if they need oxygen anyway, you've already got that. So you're two out of three steps done. So you're basically almost treating for shock every time. So it's just minimal work to get them to that treatment point. So kind of, we already kind of do that, um, but it's also very situational, right? Like if I show up to somebody who's had heat stroke, they've been outside all day in the, the sun, I'm probably not worried about conserving their body heat as much, right? Because they, they're too hot, that's the problem. So it's, it's really circumstantial, which I know is not a satisfying answer, but it, it, it's a truth, yeah. With septic, you said that the patient could be like warm to the touch uh -huh. and you're still laying there, like could they overheat from that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, have you ever tried? Have you ever tried taking your temperature after laying in your bed under like a under a blanket and sweaters and stuff? Yeah, you're gonna have a fever of like 106, and you're like, what? And then it comes down in like 15 seconds when you're outside of it. Yeah, you can overheat yourself really, really quick. So for that, do you take off the blanket and like do any other measures to cool down? Not actively. We'll talk about we'll talk about like heat stroke in a couple chapters, couple days. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to keep integrating a bunch of stuff into shock because it's going to make it harder for you to separate those when we get to that moment. Okay. Um, one thing I do want to say about shock is what do you think this person's mentality, not mentality, it's not the right word. What do you think this person's mindset is going to be like? How do you think they're going to be reacting or behaving? If you were bleeding out, how do you think you would feel in that moment? Not dizzy. I'm talking like emotionally. How would you feel? Frantic. What's another good word, good word for frantic? Anxious. Anxiety. These people are going to be super, super anxious. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, I'm bringing that up because it may or may not, hint, hint, wink, wink, be on something later. Okay, so the reason shock can be hard to identify, especially when we're talking the differences between compensated and decompensated, is because blood pressure is gonna be the last measurable factor to change, okay? For their blood pressure to be affected, right, it takes time, it takes some time. If, they're cut them, if they've cut themselves, it's gonna take a little bit for that blood to exit the body and everything to start kind of going downhill, right? Depending on the injury, of course, but it's gonna take time to develop. So it's usually a really late, excuse me, a really late sign, okay? So when a drop in blood pressure is evident, shock is already well-developed, and especially in infants and children, right? Smaller people, less blood, okay? They can lose all of their blood a lot quicker than we can lose all of ours. And then when blood pressure drops in infants and children in shock, they are close to death. Yeah, once again, not a lot of blood. Also, they have a brand new body system, right? Their systems are not developed fully, and they haven't been exposed to a lot of the world's icks yet, okay? Okay, also expect shock if a patient has any of the following. So multiple severe fractures, 
abdominal or chest injury, spinal injury, severe infection, major heart attack, or anaphylaxis. So let's play a game. What kind of shock do you think is going to happen with multiple severe fractures? Septic. What? Septic. Mm, they're closed fractures. No, not neurogenic. Hypovolemic, right? I can't hear you guys. If you're saying it, I'm sorry. Use your man voice. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, hypovolemic shock. If they're because our bones will bleed too. Which is this is actually a very good time to bring up again. Or I don't know if I brought it up, but the point. Do you guys know how much blood we can lose if we break our femur? We can lose about a liter of blood per femur. So if we broke both femurs, how many liters of blood is that? Two. Now, if you break your pelvis, you can lose a liter and a half or two liters from your pelvis. Now let me just throw a little conundrum at you. Do you think if someone was in a mechanism with enough force to bilaterally break their femurs that their pelvis is probably fine? Probably not, right? Big problems real fast, okay? So hypovolemic shock, you can bleed out through your bones breaking. If we're talking like a blunt chest injury, what kind of shock? Cardiogenic. cardiogenic, potential. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, cardiogenic, right? Blunt trauma. What is uh, one of the conditions that blunt trauma can cause with our heart? Tamponade. Tamponade, yeah, very good. If we've got a spinal injury, what kind of shock are we looking at? Neurogenic, right? High spinal cord injury. Severe infection, what kind? Sepsis. Major heart attack, what kind? Cardiogenic again, right? Why did you say, did you say sepsis? No. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, I was about to make fun of you. Uh, and then anaphylaxis obviously is anaphylactic shock or a distributive shock. So you see how you can look at each one of these injuries and already kind of have a guess. If I was to show up and this person's bad, what kind of shock they're gonna be in? Yeah. Could the abdominal or chest injury also fall under obstructive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or hypovolemic even, depending if they're bleeding. All right, that's why a lot of this is very circumstantial. Okay. I'm going to skip through this stuff. <laughs> uh, I will backtrack on this just to raise a point. If someone's bleeding from like, like someone's in a life-threatening injury, do you think it really matters what their medical history is in that moment? Not really, because is that really the problem? No. Now, it can make a role sometimes, if we're talking like older people, like old women who get osteoporosis, yeah, that, that plays a role. I have osteoporosis, I fell down. Oh, you got a broken arm, I can, that checks out, right? So you're gonna have to do some, some digging a little bit, make things make sense for yourself. Not every history is warranted, you should still ask if you can, but just understand if they're unconscious, bigger fish to fry, okay? Uh, 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 if a patient is critical, how often do we reassess them? If they're non-critical. Very good, okay. So our care for shock. As Soon as you recognize shock, begin treatment. So standard precautions, right? You're gonna notice that's on everything. What are our standard precautions again? PPE. So that's the first thing we do, right? Next thing we do, we control all obvious bleeding. So we're entering trauma, okay? We're gonna change our assessment a little bit. It goes from ABC to CAB, right? Circulation, airway, breathing, because if there's bleeding and we ignore that in a trauma circumstance, we're ignoring the problem, right? <clears throat> so follow your standard precautions, control all obvious bleeding, either with direct pressure or a tourniquet as needed, okay? Make sure the patient has an open airway and then manual inline stabilization if necessary. If we're doing manual inline stabilization, what are we worried about? Their cervical neck, right? Cervical spine, cervical neck. Yeah, same thing. I just can't talk today, it's embarrassing. Okay, uh, it's comfort, calm, and reassure the patient. Remember, these people are gonna be very scared, okay? This is a moment they are, their body is actively working to kill them, right? They're gonna be in panic mode. So don't shy away from the human moments, okay? Never allow patients to eat or drink anything prior to being evaluated by a physician. That'll be applicable to every call you run, okay? Reason being, they don't wanna send someone into a CT scanner that costs, you know, $90 million, and the first thing they do is puke into one of the vents inside that CT scanner, right? Happens. That's why, and also, uh, especially trauma, if they're worried about emergent surgeries, the anesthesiologists a lot of times are worried about um, if they've eaten anything, because if they vomit, then they're gonna have to deal with their airway while they're having an open surgery for whatever condition's going on, okay? Uh, bah -bah. If spinal mobilization's indicated, splint the patient on a backboard and provide oxygen and monitor their breathing. 
cover with blanket. I would definitely consider a call for ALS or at least consider the need, right? If you guys are working a double BLS unit and you're 50, you know, 50 to an hour away from the nearest hospital, but ALS is 30 minutes away, maybe rendezvous with them, okay? And then accurately record patient's vital signs every five throughout treatment transport, right? Because they're gonna be unstable. Okay, so treating cardiogenic shock. Patient cannot generate the necessary contraction to pump blood throughout the circulatory system for whatever reason, right? Tamponade or otherwise. A uh, patient may present with chest pain and then patients in cardiogenic shock should not receive nitro. We'll talk about nitro later. Um, some medication you guys can give. Nitro has a nasty tendency to plummet blood pressures. It helps when, it, when you use it for the right reasons, it does help, um, but it will drop blood pressures. Um, to the point that it is in your scope, but as a medic, I never ever gave nitro until I had an IV. Because I've taken people from a blood pressure of 120 down to a blood pressure of 90 with one dose. Okay, you can plummet their blood pressures. But we'll talk about those in a little bit. So, patients will usually have with cardiogenic shock a low blood pressure, a weak and irregular pulse, cyanosis about the lips and underneath the fingernails, anxiety and some nausea. Okay. Um, we can ir irregular pulse potentially depending on the situation or their history, right? If they have a history of like AFib or an abnormal heart rhythm, maybe, but for sure it's going to feel weak. Do you guys feel, remember another word for weak blood pressure? It's kind of like string. Thready. thready. Yeah. So if you see thready or weak, remember those are interchangeable terms. Okay. You're going to see both on the exams. Um, cyanosis about the lips and fingernails. What do you think the body is doing at that point? If they're starting to turn blue in the fingers and lips. They're redirecting blood. What's another word for that? Shunting. They're going to be shunting. Yeah. And then anxiety because their mind state and nausea probably because their mind state too. So for our treatment, place the patient in a position that eases breathing as you give high flow oxygen, assist ventilations as necessary, provide prompt transport and consider meeting ALS en route. Okay. Now, if we look at this, did you see anything in the treatments that does, that sounds weird or that different from uh, the three treatments I gave you? The positioning. A little bit. Now that one's dependent on their breathing and we'll, we'll get into that one when we get to breathing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can talk about it now. <sighs> breathers, breathers are tricky. Um, think about it this way, right? Gravity plays a role on everything. So if someone's having a hard time breathing, they're working to breathe. You think laying flat and having gravity pull on their whole chest is better, right? Versus if they sit up, gravity pulls their lungs down, their diaphragm down, lets it expand better. So with breathers, you'll sit them up more often than not, they breathe better. But a breather is also contradictory a little bit to treating for shock, right? Because we gotta lay them supine. So this is a moment where things get tricky, right? And you're just gonna have to figure it out depending on your patient. That's just kind of the answer. Um, I would, if I really had to, probably, if I had to put myself in that spot, I'd probably would just kind of compensate, put them at semi fowler. Let's find a middle ground, okay? You need to be a little lower, but you also need to be up a little bit. Um, so yeah, you're just gonna have to make that one work for you, regardless of what it looks like. Okay, treating obstructive shock. So, cardiac tamponade, that pericardial sac is filling with fluid, right? Blood or plasma, whatever, whichever one's going through, depending on the injury. So increasing our cardiac output is the priority. We have to get that heart contracting, right? Because that cardiac tamponade is squeezing down on the heart. It's not filling the whole way, okay? Nothing we can do about it in the field. So you're gonna apply high flow oxygen and you're gonna get them to a hospital because the only answer is surgery. The only definitive treatment is a surgery. Um, as we enter the trauma lectures, the trauma um, kind of section of this course, I want you guys to have the understanding that trauma is a surgical disease. There is nothing we can do to fix it, okay? They need a surgeon. Um, I'm also gonna potentially pop some of your guys' hero complexes real quick. Um, we are not heroes out there. We're not lifesavers. Sure, situationally, maybe. The real saviors of these people are the surgeons and doctors that we bring them to. We are the band-aid. Can we get you from here to there, okay? While you can get definitive, or so you can get definitive treatment. I always have to pop somebody's bubble and I know it's upset. it upset some people, but it is the truth. I had to pop a medic's bubble the other day. So for tension pneumos, right? Their blood pressure is starting to take a hit because that lung popped. Our answer, give them oxygen. Um, the real answer is what's called a needle decompression. Okay, so when people have a pneumothorax, what we'll do is we will 
there's two spots, but we'll put a needle, a really long, thick uh, board needle, so it's really uh, a fat needle. And you'll push it through the skin into the chest cavity. You'll pull the middle plunger and it allows air to release back out so you can open that lung back out. Uh, you can stick people a lot. So it's, I think it's fifth intercostal, no, sorry, second intercostal space, mid clavicular. I remember if you put your pinky on their nipple and your finger, your thumb on their co uh, collarbone and point, that's where you gotta stick them. And then you can also put them here. Now you, people will dart, we call it darting also. Uh, people will be darted a lot. Like I've heard of like seven different needles going into the same patient within like a 15 minute window, just popping them in. Um, that's the real only treatment for a pneumothorax. Now, uh, okay, and that's for ALS if available. One thing I didn't talk about, we don't have just pneumothoraxes. A pneumothorax is caused by air. What if there's blood in our chest? What do you think we call that? A what? Just a hemothorax. If it's just blood, it's a hemothorax. But if we have air and blood, what is it? Hemonumo. So if it's just air, it's a pneumo. If it's just blood, it's a hemo. If it's both, it's a hemonumo. okay? Now typically how this would go in my head and how I would process this is it would start as a pneumothorax. I'm, I'm just kind of separating the tension idea for a moment. It would start as a pneumothorax. As that chest started to fill with blood, it's a hemonumo, right? Until it just overfills with blood to the point it becomes a hemothorax. See how that works? As we gain blood, we lose lung space. Okay, treating shep uh, septic shock. Septic shock. Hospital management required. So standard precautions, high flow oxygen. You might need to help these people with their breathing. Give me one second, Ace. You might need to help these people with their breathing, okay, as needed. Body temperature needs to be maintained with blankets. And then notify the sepsis team. We don't have any sepsis teams here. Um, different states kind of prioritize things differently. Washington State is really big on sepsis. Um, they have another triad they teach through their school called the sepsis triad. And I can't remember, I have it written down on my phone somewhere, um, which I can teach you guys if you're interested when we get to sepsis later. Yeah, who's your question? Why did you give chest compressions in the last one if they would collapse lung? Needle de decompression. Needle decompression. So we're, we're inserting a needle to relieve that air pressure that's there. Is that within the EMT scope? Nope. It's at the medic scope. Um, yeah, it's at the medic scope. I've only ever gotten the chance to like pull out the needle and be like, I'm going to do it. And then we didn't do it because we were right there. So I never got the chance. I would have gotten the chance had I not had a surgery the first day of my internship. Um, that really changed a lot of things. But the, my literal first day of internship would have been a, a double, double wreck victim or two victim two car wreck up at Lucky Peak where they ended up needle decompressing this guy like five times. So it was a real missed opportunity. And I still think about it a lot. Okay, uh, neurogenic shock treatment. Obtain and, obtain and maintain a proper airway, spinal immobilization. Make sure if they're not breathing appropriately that we're correcting that, right? We can, if they're breathing slow as they're taking a breath, we can assist that little breath, right? Conserve body heat and assure the most effective circulation transport promptly. Okay, for anaphylaxis, this is gonna be the first medication you guys are gonna give. This is gonna be the first medication I'm giving you the doses to, so I would write these down. For epinephrine, your adult dose is 0 0.3 milligrams. 0 0.3 milligrams, you can also just write MG. Now, I'm emphasizing the zero, well, I'll move on for a second. Our pediatric dose for epinephrine, 0 0.15 milligrams. So 0 0.3 milligrams for adults, 0 0.15 milligrams for pediatrics. This is the only pediatric dose that you are required to know. Reason being is the last thing I wanna do is show up on the scene of an anaphylactic call for an eight year old and I'm like, hey, draw up epi. And you say, hold on, let me find the dose, right? We have problems that are kind of time restricting. Okay, so you're gonna be required to remember epinephrine. 0 0.3 milligrams, 0 0.15 milligrams. Emphasize the unit as well. Uh, you guys will have one other medication that's one medication that's not in milligrams. It'll be in grams and it'll be dextrose later or oral glucose rather. Um, so don't, don't worry about that for the moment. But I'm emphasizing the zero. When you guys say the doses, when you write the doses, zero point whatever. Ambulances and fire engines are loud, okay? And if I say, hey, draw me 0.3 of epi to somebody and there's a bunch of yelling and talking and they draw three of epi and I don't double check and I push it, I just killed somebody, okay? So 0 0.3, emphasize the zero in front. 
Oh, I didn't even talk about it. So first thing, yeah, we're going to administer Epi. It's going to be an IM injection. You're also going to want to write that next to it. IM, intramuscular. So you'll be giving somebody a shot in the shoulder, shot in the leg. Intra or intra? Intra. Yeah, intramuscular. Um, so you're going to give them their Epi. Epinephrine works basically in the exact opposite, right? What does septic, or not septic, excuse me, anaphylactic shock do to our vasculature? You guys remember? Vaso what? Vasodilates. What does epinephrine do to our vasculature? It constricts, right? What does, if, if I'm having airway swelling, right, and my airway starting to close off, what does epi do to my airway? It opens it up, right? Um, yeah, so when we give epinephrine, we're basically counteracting every effect of anaphylaxis. Well, they're vasodilating, we'll fix it, we'll vasoconstrict. They're bronchoconstricting, we'll bronchodilate them. So you see how it works? We're just doing the exact opposite to fix the problem. Yeah. They, they get, not amped up, but they, there's a little more energy to them. And they, they get a little bit like, you know when you scare your dog and they do like this number at you? They kind of give you that eye. Can you preface that? Like, hey, I'm going to give you Epi and you're probably going to feel a little bit like um, <clears throat> They just feel so much better that they I never really bothered telling them because time is of the essence. And if I'm going to fix the problem, I mean, you'll see the relief visibly. They'll go from like screaming tightness type breathing to, right? They're still breathing kind of hard because they got to catch their breath. But you see that physical relaxation. So a lot of times I didn't tell them. And then half the time they'd be like, oh, I'm kind of jittery right now. But like, yeah, that's the med. And so I got to really justify. <clears throat> it's the same argument like <clears throat> I made with tattoos back in the day with them. Because I used to have to wear a long sleeve the whole time I was working. And I was like, well, I really hope that the next person's life I save is like, oh, he's got tattoos. Call someone else. Right? Like they don't care in the moment. If you're helping them in the moment, they do not care. <clears throat> uh, so treatments for psychogenic shock. If an uncomplicated case of fainting, once the patient collapses, circulation to the brain is restored. When people pass out, just pass out. If they don't hit their head, they start breathing. That's why my favorite thing to tell parents, if your kid does that thing where he's like, I'm going to hold my breath till I get what I want, you can just say, do it. Because they're going to pass out, and then they start breathing again normal. Weird, right? So call their bluffs. That's all I'm saying. Don't let them control you, little goblins. Um, and if the patient fails, check for injuries. So psychogenic shock can worsen other types, right? If they have a heart problem, like they're, they're in cardiogenic shock, they took trauma, they have pericardial tamponade or cardiac tamponade, and then they have a psychogenic reaction, right? That can make that worse, especially if we're talking potentially injuries involved, right? If they fall and crack their, their head off the floor, or even like if someone's in potential neurogenic shock and they pass out and hit the floor, what are we worried about with neurogenic shock? What's the normal thing we're worried about with that? Neck injuries, right? Well, if they pass out and hit the floor, how do you think their neck's going to do? Probably not as good, right? So this can make things worse. Um, in my experience, a lot of the psychogenic shock that I've seen has been pretty straightforward. There was a car crash. Mom looked over at daughter. Daughter was bleeding from her head. Mom passed out. I've seen it a few times, okay? Um, now, if the patient res uh, reports being unable to walk after a fall, suspect another problem, right? If it's a psychogenic shock, truly psychogenic, all that's going to happen is they're going to lose consciousness. Once they're, they're horizontal again, they'll regain consciousness, okay? So if they're unable to walk, that means there's potentially injury associated now, okay? And then transport promptly. For hypovolemic shock, control all obvious external bleeding. How do you think we can control external bleeding? What do you think the first thing we're going to try is? Direct pressure. Direct pressure. Very good. If they're still bleeding after a couple minutes of direct pressure, what should we do? Tourniquet, yeah. Does a tourniquet go above or below an injury? Above, right? So we're cutting off blood supply, right? It's, you, it sounds dumb, but it would be a surprise. <laughs> now, let's say this. We put a tourniquet on. If we do a good one, do they have a pulse in their wrist? No, they shouldn't, right? Because we're clamping vasculature up here, so it's not going to ever make it to their hand. Okay. Now let's riddle me this one. If we put a tourniquet on and they're still bleeding, what do we do? Put another tourniquet on. Where do we put it? So this is a point of contention. I actually, I talked to uh, Justin Rainey, the, the guy who runs this school. He was the captain of the TAC med team at Ada County for a long time, which is the SWAT team medics. 
Um, so I asked him because every verbiage I've seen in textbooks just says the word adjacent. What does that mean, right? So I was always taught when we put a tourniquet on, we go high and tight. But then if you put another one on, you go above that tourniquet. How does that make sense though? If I'm already as high and tight as I can go, I physically can't get any higher. So he told me, you're gonna put your first one on, you're gonna go about a finger's breadth, so about an inch, and then you're gonna put the other one down below, just with about an inch separation, okay? The, the reason that we wanted to do above is because we were worried about a, a condition called compartment syndrome. And compartment syndrome is essentially where your muscles start to swell so bad that your skin is basically holding them in and they'll, they'll cut your skin open just to make room for your muscles to swell. You can cause that, um, but with that little of a space, it's not realistic. So that's, that's the justification. It'll go just below, okay? High and tight with your initial, the initial should stop, uh, should stop it. Now, next question, if we have a tourniquet, say I'm bleeding profusely, my, my whole foot got cut off, right? I'm bleeding extremely out of my, my leg. Should we put it higher or, well, we said high and tight, but it was just rationalized. If I was to put it on the shin, why would that not work as well if I was to put it on the thigh? We have two bones, right? There's two bones. Same thing with our, our forearm, right? There's two bones in here. So if you're restricting them, there's still space in between those bones versus if we go around one bone, you're gonna clamp everything. Okay, so that's the justification for high and tight. Um, now, really important with tourniquets. Really important factors. Anyone know what's our most important factor with tourniquets? Time. We have to write down the time. Now, I'm learning about what they used to teach people is like first aid and things. And for a long time, tourniquets were like, hey, this is the absolute last resort because their arm is gonna fall off after. And that's not true. The science has proved that's not true. You can leave a tourniquet on someone's arm for up to eight hours and they will still not lose their arm, okay? It's not true. So use tourniquets. Don't try to break away from that cycle. Okay, tourniquets save lives. You look confused. You got you. you know, Ace, you have a confused face. Okay, just your face. So just note the time you put it on. Right, I slapped it on. It is exactly 0952, and then from there they'll they can track it at the hospital. And once we put a tourniquet on, we never take it off. Now here's the annoying part of that. You know who loves putting on tourniquets? police officers. You know who doesn't always need tourniquets? The people that police officers put them on. Um, like I've literally seen small bleeds that they put a tourniquet on. They're like, well, he's bleeding. It's like, okay, okay, not bad enough to warrant that. Um, but once it's on, I can't take it off, right? So this guy's like, oh man, it hurts my wrist. Yeah, it sucks. Not a whole lot I can do about it. Yeah. Why? Why what? Uh, just because there's just so much, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, liability type thing, right? If you take that off and then they ended up bleeding to death, that's definitely on you in that moment. So as a cover your own type thing, they basically just leave them on. Once they're on, just leave them on. It's just a protective thing for your job, essentially. Um, there's one other point. Ah, no, it was just a story, it's not that good one. Okay, it was a good one, but it's not worth telling. So treating shock in older patients, so old people. Uh, may have more serious complications than younger ones, okay? Especially if we consider, right, as you live through life, you kind of develop conditions as you get older. It's just natural. Now, illness is not a part of aging at the same time. It's not just because you got the flu or pneumonia or whatever. That does not mean that's normal. Your activity level is going to be what guides that a lot of times, okay? So just because you're old doesn't mean you're automatically sick, but the ones that are sick tend to turn a lot quicker when we're talking shock, okay? And then another thing, many older patients take medications that mask or mimic signs of shock. Do you guys know a very common, it can be very dangerous medication type that older people will take? Blood thinners. Blood thinners are a big problem, right? Especially if we're talking hypovolemic shock, they're bleeding, a blood thinner makes it so they can't clot. So they're gonna bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed, right? Just continue to go. Um, does anyone have family that takes blood thinners in here by chance? Have you seen their arms and their legs? They have like those big bruises on them all the time. They're like, oh, would you look at that? I don't know, right? That's the blood thinner. Okay, that is the lecture. So let's do the first.